So there's one big question that I'd like to address before proceeding, and that's to cover whether the API platform is now the officially recommended way to make an API when working with Symfony 4. Now, I don't have a definitive answer on this. However, the results from the Symfony Recipes server or symfony.sh are quite interesting. What I do know is the API platform is tagged as official and somewhat strangely, the FOSRES bundle doesn't actually come up for a search on the keyword of API. Now this is because the search facility, at least at the time of recording, only considers the recipe title and with API not being in Friends of Symphony REST bundle, the search facility just misses it and this reduces discoverability. That said, even when we do find the Friends of Symphony REST bundle, the recipe itself is marked as contrib or third party so from an outsider perspective, it does appear that the API platform is the officially recommended approach for making an API with Symphony 4. With all that said, I actually love FOSRES bundle. I use it on codereviewvideos.com as well as on a bunch of other sites. It's still actively maintained and featureful and potentially a great fit for your needs. So as ever, use your best judgment and be grateful that a variety of options exist. So to work with the API platform most easily, you're going to need Docker and Docker Compose. If you're new to Docker, then I have a tutorial series on the site. It's called the Docker Tutorial for Beginners. Everything that you're going to need to know for this is covered in that course. The link is in the show notes. So compared to the basic Symfony 4 JSON API approach and the Symfony 4 with FOS REST bundle approach, getting set up here is an absolute breeze. Start by heading over to the download page. Again, there's a link in the show notes. I'm going to be working with the API platform version 2.2.6, which is the most recent at the time of recording. Now, please note that if using a later version of the API platform, things may be different. For best compatibility with this tutorial, please stick to 2.2.6. Don't be alarmed by the fact that I've used the command line here. All I've done is downloaded the archive and extracted it to a directory on my local machine. Now I'm going to go ahead and bring the API platform up and online. So change directory into that newly extracted directory, and I'm just going to run the command docker-compose up. Now the terminal is going to fill up with a bunch of output here and depending on the speed of your internet, the speed of your computer and whether you've downloaded any of these Docker images before, this can take quite a long time. As a base of reference, it took me about 15 minutes from running this command with having nothing downloaded to having a fully working stack. Now one thing that's worth pointing out is that if you have Postgres up and running on your machine already, then for simplicity's sake, I would suggest that you stop your local Postgres instance now, if you're feeling daring, you could change the exposed public port in the docker compose.yaml file to something other than 5432. And if you do, don't forget to update the API slash .env file. Honestly, that's more trouble than it's worth. And if you're just playing around and you don't need immediate access to that local instance of Postgres, then I would suggest just stopping it as it's miles easier. Now, it's at this point that the output on your screen actually starts to get a bit more interesting. If we'd have run the command docker compose up with the minus D, for detached flag, we wouldn't actually see any of this interesting background output. Most typically when working with Docker on a day-to-day -day basis, you will work with it in the background because you don't really need to see a lot of this stuff. But for the purposes of demonstration, or if it's the first time you've ever seen Docker, this can be quite interesting. What you're seeing, for example, here is that when the PHP container comes up, it's doing the composer install process, but the output is also sort of intermingled with the other containers output. So like the client one is your web front end. And so it's bringing up a web server on port 80. And you'll also see the admin container, which will allow you to access the admin website via port 81. And there's a cache container that allows you to access the website and the admin website via HTTPS and so on. Now this heavy reliance on Docker can make this quite intimidating for a beginner. You can see that we've got some output here that's telling us that we've got a website that's supposedly running on localhost port 3000. And if we try and visit that, then it's not actually going to load. And you may be wondering why I've just said it's running on port 80, but the output is telling you it's on port 3000. And that is because it's running on port 3000 in the container, but the container is exposing that port publicly via port 80. To give us an overview of what we get out of the box, I'm going to open up the HTTP version of the API in the browser, and I'm also going to open up the HTTPS admin panel. Now, because we're accessing our API via a browser, content negotiation is going to understand that we're accessing this in a HTML format, and it's going to display us our open API spec documentation. You may recognize this as being very Swagger-esque. Now, one of the really nice parts about the API platform, in my opinion, is the inclusion of the admin backend. And this is automatically generated for you based on your project's entity structure. So you don't really need to do anything except define your entities and the API platform is gonna do most of the hard work for you. 
is a massive time saver. We will get on to using the admin panel momentarily, but for now I just want to take a quick look at what we get in terms of documentation. We can see that we've got a variety of routes available to us, including get one, get many, post, which will allow us to create new greeting resources, put to replace existing resources, or in other words, an edit functionality, and also a delete functionality. And for each of these, we can see the shape of the data, and we can also execute a request to see how that request actually works. All of this from the website, it's really cool. Of course, this is just documentation, and it's not really typical that you would work this way on a day-to-day -day basis, it's, or at least I don't anyway. You would more likely use a client like Postman, or if you're more of a command line person, just send in the raw curl requests, which it also gives you. Now, at this stage, our API doesn't actually have any data, so the requests that we're sending in aren't really that interesting. They kind of prove that our API works, but without any data to see, it's a little bit boring. So let's create some new data using the admin backend and then see what a difference that makes to both the documentation output and a request inside Postman. So we can see here an example of a collection get, which is just hitting the root of the greeting resource. And then we can also make a direct request to the entity or the greeting with ID one. And the biggest thing really to point out at this point is that many sort of API implementations, especially demo implementations, will come with some seeded resources or, or stuff along that lines. But what we're seeing here is pretty much all the functionality that you're going to get the second that you create your own entity. And we'll see this as we go through the remainder of this part of this course. The speed at which you can be productive is unparalleled in my opinion. Now there's just one final piece that I'm going to cover before wrapping up here. And it's the same stuff that you'll have seen if you've followed along with the Docker tutorial for beginners. Or if you just work with Docker on a day-to-day -day basis, you've probably got some sort of setup like this. This is the way that I do it anyway. So I'm going to create a make file. I'm going to add in a couple of commands, the ones that I normally use, which would be make dev. And what that's going to do is allow me just to run the command make dev, but really that's going to be a shortcut for Docker Compose down, which makes sure that if I have an environment up and running already, then it's going to cleanly shut it down before proceeding further. Then I'm going to run a Docker Compose up, making sure to set the detach flag, the minus D. I'm also going to pass in remove orphans, which just ensures that if you change the Docker Compose.yaml file at any point whilst your environment's up and running, the next time that you stop and restart your Docker environment, it wipes out any sort of leftover containers. I also add in a command down, which just runs the Docker Compose down command. This just allows me to run make down rather than having to type in Docker Compose down. It's a real convenience thing rather than any sort of necessity. And there's a couple of reasons that I do this. The first is that particularly with Symfony 4, when you're working with environment variables, if you make a change to them, the only way that you can get them to take effect is to restart the environment. So that's one reason why I use that make dev command, because it just allows me to quickly take the environment down and bring it back up. And I like the make down command because it's just a habit now that I run that at the end of any session and that makes sure that I've cleanly shut down. Of course, you're completely free to disregard all of this, but you know, it works for me.